Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. From the heartland of America and the gateway to the West, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie. This is Coast to Coast AM. Paul, welcome back. We were praying for you, my friend. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you for that, George. Good to be here. How close did those fires get to you? Not close. I'm on the North Shore. The fires were on the other side of the island. There were fires in Kula up country that were closer, and, um, and I was sheltering people here during that. What a tragedy. My God. My God. Tell us what happened uh, to you back uh, years ago for that experience in 1987. Well, I, I had just quit drinking. I was 25. I had started praying, uh, and I was raised an atheist, so I didn't believe in any of that stuff. But I started doing that, and then I heard this voice telling me to get my act together, and I listened to it. And a few months later, there was this thing happening. People were calling it the harmonic convergence, and they said people were going to be waking up. And I thought in my naivete, well, if there is a God or such a thing as God, and I was starting to wonder if there might be, and you asked to be woken up, why would it want to say no? And I went up to the roof of my house where I was living in New York City at the time, uh, with a crystal and a mantra, somebody had given me one of those things each, and I tried to teach myself to meditate the night before this event. And I had what people have described as a spontaneous kundalini awakening. I may, ne I may never really know what happened, but it was an experience of energy moving through my body and out through the top of my head that left me frozen up there on the roof and swaying in this energy. And I felt safe, and I knew something was happening. And I started to see little little lights around people after that, like fireflies. So I was beginning to open up. And it was, a, it was an awakening to a whole other life, I have to say. And it wasn't very graceful, and it wasn't terribly pleasant for a while, because my life as I had known it was being challenged in, in very real ways. And, of course, uh, you have become one of the world's most renowned channelers. It's truly remarkable. Uh, your book here is the 11th book, the Book of Innocence. And though you are writing the book, the channel of the spirits are writing through you, aren't they? Well, you know, there's actually no writing involved at all. I sit in a chair. I close my eyes. I hear one phrase repeated. I give voice to that one phrase, and everything else tumbles out on top of it. And the unedited transcripts of the recordings of these sessions become the books. And I think the last eight books, seven or eight, were done entirely in front of audiences. Um, so I don't, write, I, I don't write these things. I literally am a stenographer taking verbal dictation. And that's how these things come into being. When we take calls, Paul, you'll take some uh, mm -hmm. questions from our great listeners. We don't want to talk about the dead or anything like that from them. But uh, you, you actually go into like a trance-like state or something, don't you? Yeah, I work two different ways. When I'm here, I'm a radio. Think of me like a radio. When I'm, I'm channeling the guides, they're the station that I'm tuned into. And sometimes I whisper the words as they come and repeat them. And that's one way that I work. And when I work psychically, I, they call me a medium for the living. So I don't get your, your dead Ann Alice, but if Alice is living two states away and you haven't spoken for five years, I may be able to tune into her and tell you what's really going on and support a healing in that dynamic. Now, when you deal with channeling over the years, have you noticed a change in the spirits or how you work? Yeah, big time. When I started, I, I didn't believe in channeling, really. I, I, started, I studied a form of energy healing, and when I had my hands on people's bodies, I started to hear things for them that would pan out. And that was the beginning of Clear Audience. And I had a little group that met in my apartment in New York City for 18 years where people would come, and I would start to hear, but mostly we were working with the energy. 
when I was 48 years old and I started doing this, you know, much younger, I quit smoking and I've been a heavy smoker and suddenly they started dictating full lectures and very shortly after I was willing to transcribe them and record them, they began dictating the books. Fascinating indeed. Now the name of this book is called The Book of Innocence. Tell me about that title. I was surprised by the title, too. I don't know the title until they announce it. (laughs) I really don't. And I go, oh, brother, what's this one going to be about? But they say that there's an aspect in all of us that is in what they call the, they call it the upper room. They say it's the octave of consciousness or vibration above what, what they call the common field, which is our idea of the reality that we're engaging in. And this part of us has never been tainted by fear and doesn't know itself in the kind of separation that we've really been indoctrinated in, in this reality that we've known. So this aspect of us is in innocence and in wonder and in awe. And this is the part of us, they say, that is lifted to what they call, you know, the upper room, which is a level of consciousness. But what they also say is that in the common field that we know, everything we see around us was named by somebody who came before us. We're living in a museum of other people's ideas. And the true self or the monad or the God within, whatever you want to call it, that innocent aspect of us, isn't tied to those beliefs, those meanings, and those structures. And consequently, when that aspect of us is moving into articulation or manifestation as and through us, it's also reclaiming our idea of memory or what's supposed to be. They say every memory we have is actually informed by a false belief in separation, that we're separate from the source of all things and separate from one another. So they're really working in this book with reclaiming memory, which is inclusive of our idea of who we've been or the terrible things that happened to us, and not about forgetting them or whitewashing them, but coming to them from a very different perspective. The guides say everything is holy, um, but we can deny the divine in anything, which is, you know, what we're used to doing. Paul, can you describe what the spirit guides are, who they are, what were they? Were they humans who died? Are they angels? What are they? Well, they call themselves teachers. They've come with a name, and they've used a name through me for a long time, and they call themselves Melchizedek, which is a priesthood. I'm not that attached to the names. They've said some of us have been informed, some of us have not. They have some, of, some have only known themselves in consciousness. There's one I've seen, and he's the only one that I've seen over the years in a very specific way. But it's a consortium. It's a collective. They come with a we. Occasionally, I can notice the slight differences in vocabulary as they as they work, or the differences in the accents that occasionally come through. But they're, um, you can say, ascended masters, although I don't like that term either, because it's gotten kind of loaded with things. So I think of them not as sort of dead people, but of beings that have moved to a level of consciousness beyond... I guess you would call it the astral or beyond what we think of as, you know, where you go when you die. And they're here to help. I remember when you were first on with me years ago mm-hmm. and uh, the channeling occurred. Yeah. It kind of scared me I, when I first heard it. Yeah. Well, it scared me, too. And not when I heard it. <laughs> it was when it started happening. I was going, what the heck is this? This isn't my my normal way of operating. But they're not scary and they're extraordinarily loving. And they come with a a message of of real healing um, and and transformation. They say the world is on the brink of enormous change. I believe that. Are you are you aware of what they're saying through you when you're doing it? I'm taking dictation and I hear phrase after phrase after phrase. If you can imagine somebody reading 300 fortune cookies, one after the next rapidly, that's what my experience is like. I retain about a third of it Uh from a lecture. So I'm present, but I'm receded. I'm not in a deep trance. I'm not like Edgar Cayce who went to sleep. I'm here, but I'm slightly removed. When I'm reading, I'm more present. So if you can imagine that when I'm channeling, I'm climbing into the back seat of the car and turning the wheel over, and when I'm reading, I'm sharing the front seat. Do you tape yourself so you can have a record of this? Everything's recorded, yeah. I okay, mean, I don't good. do, I can't, you know, I don't do this for myself 
personal readings for myself. That's not how I work. The, the work that comes through me have, has always been for others and since the very beginning. But I channel a lot, and I do you know workshops that are live and online, and and everything is recorded um, and transcribed. And it's now you know there's an enormous archive at this point. I mean, there's tw- I just finished channeling the twelfth book about four or five days ago. And I don't know how many thousands of pages of material there are from the books and then on top of everything else, all the other lectures that they've offered. So they're prolific and they like to talk. And I, my job is to sit there in the chair and try to keep up with it. We're talking about the second book in the Manifestation Trilogy. It's called The Book of Innocence. Paul's website is linked up at coasttocoastam.com. It's his name, Paul, S-E-L-I-G.com. He's on Facebook. He's got a presence on Twitter as well. How often are you dealing with the spirit guides? Every day? Yeah, every day. I'm not always channeling every day. I still, you know, have have clients that I, I work with. So I'm reading for them. But uh, most of my work now is channeling. The book that was just delivered, that was five weeks of dictation. took place over 22 days of sessions um, and all in front of, you know, different groups of students. So I've been kept very busy by this. Your spirit guides talk about what is called reclamation of memory. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, it's kind of what I was alluding to earlier, the idea that all of our memory is tainted through this lens of separation or is operating in this belief that we're separate from source and everything else is. And it's also tainted by this idea of fear. And the guides I work with say that the action of fear is to claim more fear. Every choice we've made in fear gets us more of the same. So if you can imagine that we're swimming in a in a swimming pool that was polluted before we even got in it, but we think that's all we get, they're actually clearing the water up. And a lot of the water actually is how we hold things in memory and the meaning that things have been given culturally, collectively, historically. I mean, we all know that, you know, history is is generally written by the victor, you know, the one who wins the war. That's right. And and our, our realization of what really is there is highly distorted. I think who we think we are, what we think we're capable of, how limited we believed ourselves to be, is all informed by this kind of memory, which has become a belief system and a kind of a false ceiling that we continue to bump up against. And the guides are... I believe, taking us beyond that to what exists beyond that, which is our true nature. Have you ever had a guide you didn't like? Not a personal guide, no. You know, I people sometimes say, would you ask my guides? And I really, for the most part, just hear my own. Occasionally, I'll tune into somebody, and this is more psychic than channeling, and I'll get a very abrupt and angry energy that's, you know, and it's challenging, and these have been at times, you know, people who've been dealing with things like, you know, eating disorders and things mm-hmm. that are really hurting the body. And when I try to tune into the part, that part of them says, get, the, get away from me now, you're not coming near this, or, you know, this is going to continue until, you know, it's, it's lower energy stuff. That's the best way that I can describe it, and I don't encounter it often, but I have. Um, but the guides I work with are teachers. They're not the personal guides who tell you, you know, what car to buy, you know, or, you know, where to, I don't know, where to, where to put the couch in the living room. I think people have those guides. That's not what these folks are. They're, they're higher beings, and they really come with an agenda, which is really far beyond me. It's really for all of us. What do you prefer, your psychic abilities or your channeling abilities? What I like about the psychic abilities um, is that I, it can be verified, you know, so I've been filmed stepping into people that were, you know, if, if, uh, like if you ask about a relative and I step into the relative and I'm being filmed, you'll see how I may somatize the relative, start to look like that person, start to gesture like them. So I like all that stuff. And the readings are practical. They're addressing our practical lives and relationships. And for me personally, they've helped me trust the channeled work, which is so far out there. You know, the fact that I can close my eyes and dictate a whole book that doesn't require editing is... is, is well, it's magnificent. Nuts, you know, Absolutely. but 
the small things I can manage. So, you know, sometimes it's where did I leave my car keys? I don't do a lot of that stuff. You know, I mostly work with relational things. I, I, but I've worked with, you know, parents with kids who have never spoken, you know, people with locked-in syndrome, people mm-hmm. with comas. You, you're able to access information. As long as somebody has a body, I seem to be able to have some kind of access I have to tell people that I'm not a psychic spy. People call and they say, it's <laughs> husband cheating, and I'm not going to go there. Remote view on tune them. in. Yep. What, what do you, when we take calls next hour, are you the psychic or the channeler? It depends on what the question is. If it's about world stuff, I mean, if it's about consciousness, if it's about spiritual growth, the guides come, th- come through. I don't think they care if we get the promotion at work. I think they've got bigger fish to fry. But if somebody's asking about their boss, that's psychic. If you're asking about, you know, what your, I don't know, what, how you can move beyond the unhappiness or where you're stuck, the guides can often come through with that stuff too. But you're flexible with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm flexible. Okay, great. Now, what do the guides mean by a world made new? Hey, that's the, that, that, well, that's the book that they just finished. That was that's the title of the twelfth book. That's the one after the Book of Innocence. The one after that, but there's probably a title, "A World Made New." In the last book, they tend to build on their teachings. Um, a world made new is what we're coming to, and it's a world they say that's claimed at a higher level of consciousness. They say, you know, we've been at war for so long that we can't imagine a world without it. They said we've been at war since somebody picked up the first rock and threw it at somebody else. So to move beyond that, because we tend to get what we expect, and we expect what we've had, we have to move to a level of consciousness where other things are possible, and that's what they're doing in the work. They actually say that you align at a level of consciousness and vibration where you become a conduit or a doorway for what they call the upper room, or this is, you know, call it the higher, higher, the higher octave of spirit the expression of spirit. And they say it is that level of consciousness that actually reclaims everything. They say sometimes things like God sees God in all of its creation. So the aspect of you or anyone who knows who they are beyond the personality structure is actually witnessing the inherent divine and manifestation. It's a trippy teaching. It kind of gets into physics, I think, but I, I failed science, so I don't think of it that way. You failed something? I, I, I highly I doubt that. I was a stoner in high school. It's, it's astonishing that I got into any school, my alone God. graduate school. But yeah, no, I, math and science were not my things at all, and they're still not. Do you have a favorite spirit guide? The one that I see, the one with the beautiful blue eyes. Um, he's the one I've seen, and when I channel live people have seen my eyes i'm told turn a very very pale blue people think i have blue eyes and i have hazel eyes they'll come and look at me and say that's not the color i was seeing but when i'm channeling sometimes they'll be right in front of people and looking at them and that's something that happens but i recognized him when i saw him and i was under hypnosis and somebody brought him through and i was surprised i wasn't expecting anything to happen and I saw those eyes, and I saw how deeply compassionate they were. What are called attunements? Well, the guides work with attunements, and they're energetic attunements which are invoked through language. So you can think of them, I guess, as incantations. But they're claims of truth. The guides say what is true is always true. And when you speak them you can feel the energy that accompanies them. And each attunement is working to facilitate an acceleration in the energetic field and the awareness that accompanies it. So the attunements are actually in all of the books, and they escalate as they go forward. And the attunements now are really well beyond personal realization, but moving towards how a world is realized at a higher level of consciousness. When you first started channeling, did you think you were going nuts? You know, I was fortunate that I was studying with a teacher, this old, old, um, you know, Irish lady, you know, who had been one of the first Reiki masters in the U.S. And I just had a context that there was something going on and I had people to talk with. And I've had mentors show up 
throughout my life at varying stages, and I'm very grateful for that because I think it's hard to go into this stuff without some kind of support because it can be scary. The channeling wasn't scary, but the information that I get is not scary. And I'm wary when people are channeling messages that are fear-based, that are causing conflict and blaming, because that tends to be low-level stuff. And so you have to be in discernment when you do this about the level of, of, of frequency or spirit that you're attending to. I like to say, you know, my grandma was married five times. She's not who I want to go to for relationship advice <laughs> on the other side. She's right. happy to give it, but, you know. Or if you're going to go to someone, go to someone who's been married before. Yeah. Yep. Have Have you ever channeled and you felt uncomfortable with it? You just didn't, you felt uneasy with it? Yeah, often, often. What causes that? When I'm challenged by the information, um, when the information feels contradictory to what I would normally believe, that's usually happening when they're pushing me outside of my comfort zone, and every book has pushed me outside farther and farther. So those things make me uncomfortable. Um, I, I'm cautious when I work. People want me to channel on world events and this and that. And the guides, you know, it's funny. I actually listened to a recording. I never listened to myself. There was a video that popped up of a channeling that I gave March, end of March 2020 when COVID was first hit. And it was right before I moved to Maui. It's a fascinating lecture. It's up, and it's up on YouTube. I'm sure that's where it lives. But it was amazing to read that because it was giving very sage advice on how to manage that time and all of the confusion at that time. Um, but as I was delivering it, I'm sure I was miserable because I'm going, you know, who am I and what is this and why are they, they giving us this information? But it was required. So I'm not the guy to channel on, you know, this idea or that idea that is, you know, running around in the National Enquirer, but I may be the guy to support other people in, in, in awakening up to their own true nature. Paul, you you'd mentioned that this planet is going you know, to undergo yeah. some huge things. Is it yeah. positive or negative? What I've been told is that humanity has decided at a collective level, and I guess this is almost like, I, mean, I don't talk about things like oversoul, but they say humanity has made a choice to make it because we know that if we don't change, we're not going to, that we've created the capacity to destroy ourselves, and we're not going to do that. So that I found very encouraging, but they did say it's going to be about four generations for us to begin to realize the new and that we're in a period now of, of real transition, real challenge, and that I don't get that that gets easier. I think it gets easier when we understand that we're essentially on board a ship going across an ocean that's rocky and, and difficult and stormy, but we're going to another level of, of, of humanity, of, of being ourselves. They say it's actually a change in the species that we're undergoing. And I don't mean to sound too far out, but they say we're coming into an awareness of who we've always been and that we have been denying. And that's very positive. And they say this is happening to everybody now. Do the guides come to you or do you go to them? It's almost an agreement, you know. I mean, they've never stood me up, and I'm really grateful for that, you know, in front of an audience. I mean, if I say I'm going to show up at 8 and I do my little preparation, which is a quick prayer that I say to myself, they're there. Um, so I think we're meeting. When I first started, when I was in my early 30s, and I'm 61 now, I used to feel like I had a tin can up to my ear, and I was hoping somebody would pick up the other can with a string yeah. and I'd be able to hear and now it's present. I'm a radio. It's just like tuning a dial, and boom, I'm, I have access. So they're always there. Paul, why are they there? What are they trying to do? What do they want us to learn? They want us to know who we are and who we have always been and what we've denied. You know, this isn't a religious teaching. They talk about God, and they say, call it whatever you want, and they, call, they talk about the God within, and they say, call that what you want but that we're in a period of rearticulation. We're reawakening to our own true nature at the cost of the old, and that's a real challenge. 
So they're here to teach us how to get through this. And I think how to know ourselves and each other in a much higher and more loving way. Where are they in terms of logistics? Are they in another dimension? Yeah, are they... That's how I understand it. You know, they say that they meet for the classes, for the dictation. They meet in what they call the upper room. And they've called that Christ consciousness. They've called it the octave above the common field. Um, but that they say they actually express in a higher reality than that, but that's where we can meet them and I can take the dictation from. Neil Donald Walsh has said that he had a conversation with God. Did he or was he dealing with the spirit world and thought it was God? You know, I, I don't know his work and I don't know... I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'd have to ask my guides about that, and I don't know that that's fair. I tend not to comment on other channels' work. But I think everything is of God, and I think that's true. I don't think of God as having personality. I think that that's not how it operates. I think that you can tune into an aspect of the Creator that can come in a way that can be understood, which is, I suspect what I do. I don't think of them as spirit guides in a, at a low-level tone. You know, the guides have described themselves in several ways, and sometimes they say we are who you become when you know who you are, and other times they call themselves the true self, and the true self is the God within, or you can call it the Christ within. It's that level of, of awareness and, and love. So I trust that, and I, I'm cautious truthfully, and it may sound surprising, I'm cautious when anybody says they're hearing God or they're hearing this or they're hearing that. I think mm -hmm. it has to be checked out, you know, and there, there, you know, there were a bunch of guys in a, in a mental institution claiming they were Jesus all at the same time. They made a movie of it finally. But, you know, I think that we all have the ability to access higher truth, but I don't think that that means that just because somebody is hearing something that it's necessarily of the highest source. And that's where discernment is very useful. Paul, if an asteroid were zooming toward planet Earth, would they come to you and say, Paul, you got to get this word out, like right now? I don't think so. It hasn't really yet. Well, I don't think so. They did tell me that there was... I've, I've gotten two things. I was told about 9-11 before it happened, but I didn't believe it. But I don't know that I would get that. Um, I think I have a fairly good intuitive sense. The guide said recently, when somebody asked, they, you know, I said, I said, well, I think they saved me from something really terrible once. And they said, actually, about 25, about 20 times we've done that. But you don't even know it. And I can trust that. But I don't think that I'm more special or more valuable than anybody else. I have this weird gift, and I hope that if something is coming, I will be elsewhere. But if it's an asteroid, where are we going to go? You know Exactly. Yeah. Have you ever been on a plane when you get into the channeling mode, and what do people sitting next to you think? I don't, you know, I don't tune into people. If you, I mean, is that, do I just, like, tune into the person next to me? Is that what you're asking? Well, I mean, do they, like, go listen to you going, you know, because I've, I've heard you channel oh, yeah. before, and it's, yeah. it's, it's different. It's well, different. I'm not doing it on an airplane, you know. Um, I'm not doing it. I mean, I'm doing it in front of uh, in an auditorium. So you're not people. spontaneous like that? No, no, yeah. no. If I'm working psychically, I, you know, I, if somebody asked me a question and I was on an airplane and I had to tune in, I could do it. Right. I have this odd habit of muttering you know, what I hear as I hear it and then repeating it, but I don't always do that with the psychic stuff. So I could do that, and I think it would be fine and effective. Um, but channeling, there's no need to do it there. I can't imagine a situation where I would be called to deliver a, a teaching on an airplane, unless there was a person sitting next to me who was asking, and the guides had something to say to them, and I suppose then it would happen, and it would sound like whatever it sounded like. Are the guides happy about our future? I think so, actually. I think they hold deep love for us. I think they have concern. I get that at times. But the concern is primarily about how we treat each other. You know, one of their teachings is who you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. 
what you damn and who you damn damns you back. And that's just a teaching of a chord, a vibrational accord, like you yeah. like. It's like karma. It is karma. Yeah, it's, well, it is like karma. But they say karma is, um, is opportunity to learn. They, they, they talk about karma as, as, as opportunity for education. But if you think of it, the guides have said a million times through me, you cannot be the light and hold another in darkness. It's the height of hypocrisy. You can't do it. And we do it. You know, self-righteousness, they say, is always the personality self. Because the true self or the divine self doesn't have a stake in being right in the way that the personality does. Paul, your previous books, can people still get them? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. They're all, they're all up. They're all available online. And they're on my, you can get them on my site, or, but through the major booksellers. So they're easy to get, and they're all in print. Is it possible that they would simply abandon you one day and they'll be gone? <laughs> I suppose anything's possible. It hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, I'm never going to get another job in academia after all this channeling. It's not going to happen. I, I left that, 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 that ship sailed. So I hope they stick around. But I'm, I mostly hope they stick around because I'm still so curious about this. Um, I can do the psychic work without their direction and, you know, have. But I think that this is a relationship that I have with them that probably predates this lifestyle, this lifetime. And I suppose, because I do have free will, if I say, that's it, I can't do this anymore, I suppose that would be the end. But it hasn't happened yet. So we'll see. And they've been, I mean, they've delivered 12 books in, I think, 13, 14 years, you know, and... Um, I wouldn't mind a break, and I'm actually going to write my own book after this and tell my story, which is uncomfortable to do, but that's my next assignment, and we'll see. That book's going to be like an autobiography? It'll be a memoir, yeah, about what this was like and how it happened. It's been an interesting ride for you, hasn't it? Unbelievable. Really unbelievable and not always easy. And now I look at my life, and I'm, I'm fairly astonished at what's happened. And I couldn't have planned it and I couldn't have chosen it. I wouldn't have known that it was possible. I wouldn't have known, you know. So it helps me to trust this. We're going to take calls with Paul Selleck next hour. Uh, he'll need your name and a quick question. We will not talk about the dead. He's not a medium, and we won't go there. But what other questions do you prefer, Paul? I like relational questions, general questions. What am I here for? I'm not crazy about but I haven't talked to my, my kid isn't speaking to me or why am I stuck in my romantic life or what's happening in the relationship with this person I'm trying to date. All those things are fair game. They call me a medium for the living. So as long as somebody still has a body, I can usually tune into them with the first name, sometimes last initial. Jobs, whether I should move from a house, things like that too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can do that. Great. We've got a few email questions that have come in for you too. We'll go through some of those, but the... Your phone calls are priority, so folks, make the calls if you can get in. I think the lines may be already jammed. Paul Selig with us. We'll be doing that next hour. Paul, and like you know, we said, you've been doing this since 1987? Not channeling. I started waking up in 87. Um, I started channeling. I started hearing in 87, but the way that I work now took some time, but I've been doing this since I was maybe 30, 31 is when I first had my first group. I bet you're fun at parties. That's very funny. No, I'm terrible at parties. And you know, I'm really terrible. I'm very shy, actually. I'm, I'm a good host. I'm a rotten guest. I, I lurk in the corner. Paul, what are some of the important teachings of the guides that you have learned over the years? Oh, well, some I've mentioned. You know, the action of fear is to claim more fear. So I try not to make choices based in fear because I know that it's going to get me more of the same that what you damn damns you back and what you bless blesses you and to damn something is to deny the inherent divine in it or in the person or the situation because you can't kind of decide that if there is a god it's just some places that you have to sort of go to this all or nothing idea which is extraordinarily challenging but real growth comes as a result of this the guides have said that the only real problem humanity faces is what they call the denial of the divine or the refuting, what they call the inherent presence of source that they say is in everything. 
These abilities that you have as a psychic versus a channeler, do you turn them on and off at will? Well, to an extent. I mean, I find that if I ask myself a question, they might pipe in, which is the first way that I begin to understood that I heard, you know, that I was hearing information that was valuable. And so I'm cautious, um, and I don't read for myself for the most part as a result of that. But the psychic stuff, I don't step into people, which is how I read, by tuning into them, unless I'm working with someone. It really doesn't occur to, to me to do that in my personal life. Interesting. Okay, you ready for some calls? Do my best. This hour is going to fly by, and what you're going to hear from Paul Selig is the channeling. He goes through a metamorphosis where they basically are talking through him, but you'll hear it. You'll understand what I'm talking about when uh, we do it. We're going to go to first-time caller Jeannie in Ohio. Welcome to the program. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, George, and hi, Paul. First-time caller, I'm so excited. This is different for you. What would your question be for Paul? Okay, Paul, I'm, I've had a difficult time with my uh, son. Um, he hasn't talked to me for like 12 years. Okay. And it's been since he got married. Okay. And I, I, just, I, I just would like to get back in touch with him. Right. Jeannie, let us, let us ask you one question before Paul jumps yeah. in here with his channeling. Oh. Why isn't yeah. your son talking to you? Um, I'm, I'm really not sure. Uh, um, I, I used to drink a lot, and, but I wasn't drinking then. And he even came to a group therapy with me. Mm-hmm. And he was like, well, I don't have a problem with my mom. I'm just like, what? <laughs> you know, but um, after he had his child and he got, well, he got married and he had his child, you know, I don't know if it's his wife or. She's not reached out to you? Oh, no, no. I text him. He never responds. I, I call him. He never responds. Um. Does he live next to you? Same state? No, he, uh, no he's in our state. It's just an hour drive away. All right, and, Paul. Paul well, let's let Paul take over with his channel guides. Go ahead, well, I'm Paul. Gonna, I'm going to do this psychically, which is I'm going to tune into Jeannie first. I'm going to ask for the son's name, maybe the wife's Hi, name. And then if the guides want to say uh, something, they're going to pop in. So let me go to you, Jeannie, okay. first. You, there's actually okay. a lot of panic around you. You come through panicking and, and, and waving like you're trying to get the attention of this guy. His first name, please. His name is Brendan. It's B-R-E-N-D-A-N. He's got his middle finger up, I'm sorry, which is just means boundary. It means back off, back off, back off. He knows you're there. He knows you want him, and he's shielding himself. And the reason I get it is because there's stuff he doesn't want to look at. He covers his eyes as if he doesn't want to see. My feeling is if he does see you, he's going to have to deal with a lot of his own stuff and his own pain. Can I have his wife's first name, please? Uh, Jennifer. Let me just go here. Well, she's actually, you know, the funny thing is she's just ignoring you. She's just dismissing you. She's not actually blocking him because that's what I was wondering. And she's not. She's just waving you away like stay over there, stay where you are, we're fine. I'm going to go to the guides with this. My guides are saying the young lady wants to know, will she see her son again in time? I hear in time you will, be prepared, but be prepared. There's, there's recrimination. There's, there's old stuff that needs to be addressed in order to move beyond the past. It's like a block at the heart that's really almost between you. So I'm going to ask what you can do now to support yourself. Love him yeah. as he is. I hear trust. I'm surprised to hear this. Trust that he will come. He will speak again, that you will speak again. But I hear don't make it hard. Don't make it hard. The idea here is sometimes, you know, you have to let go of somebody in order for them to come back. I don't feel, and this may be of some help, that he's doing this to hurt you. This is not intentionally to cause harm. He's doing this in some way to protect himself and protect himself from his own stuff that I don't think he really wants to look at. Okay? I hope that helps some. 
All right. Good luck, Jeannie. Hope that works for you, too. And, and so what we what we just heard was a piece of you as the psychic. Yeah. And then the channeler. Exactly. The guides will sometimes come in with commentary. You know, their agenda is more about how we how we develop and how we care for ourselves. Less so are we going to get what we want or what we're hoping for. I mean, they understand, I think, what we go through in a larger spectrum of, of possibilities for our own growth and learning. I've never been one to understand how somebody could let 12 years go by and not talk to your mother. Well, I've, I run into a lot, unfortunately, in the readings. You know, parents do it to kids sometimes. Kids do it to parents. Oftentimes, you know, it's uh, the marriage does it, which is why I was wondering, but I really wasn't feeling that that was what was present here. But, yeah, it's hard, and people can be very cruel, and there's really no need. It doesn't solve much. I think you can detach with love, but there's got to be the love there to do that. Let's go to the state of Georgia. Colleen's with us. Welcome to the program. Hi, Colleen. Hi. How are you? Uh, Today's my birthday. I made it to 63. Well, happy birthday. Thank you. Um I need to find out about this trailer in my yearly forecast for finances. I'm sorry, the question is the trailer? I didn't hear something? Yeah, the trailer that I'm living in right oh, now. Okay. okay. And my yearly forecast for finances. Okay, I don't do yearly forecasts, but I'll tune into you and see what you want to tell me about the trailer. Here. Well, funnily enough, you're looking around as if you've got to get out of there. you got to get out of there. You actually feel okay when I go to you. You're placing everything in front of you as if you know where everything is, where things are supposed to be. And I actually, when I go to the finances, you show me the money symbol, which is good, and you show me it going into your own pocket. When usually I see that, it's money that actually comes direct. It's less paycheck than something that actually comes to your hand and right into the pocket. Um, Anything about your living situation? I'm going to go to you. See, you're interesting because you don't want anybody to tell you what to do, and you're kind of glaring all around you to make sure that nobody's going to do this. But I don't know if this is true, but I actually feel that if you were to be able to move, this would actually be a positive thing for you. What do you mean? Trailer? Um, yeah, or wherever you're situated right now, you could you could use the change, yes. Trailer, trailer. yes, trailer. I'm hearing yes to the trailer. Uh, the trailer is going to be mine or what? Well, that wasn't the question you asked. You were asking okay. about your finances and a trailer. So if you're looking yeah. to move, then you're getting a trailer. I would say yes to the trailer. Yes. Yeah, because the landlords just screwed me over when I moved in here, okay. and now we haven't sense. had no mail in yeah. four months. Uh-huh. That makes sense. How big is the trailer, Colleen? Pardon? How big is the trailer? It's a two-bedroom. I really can't tell you on size, though, hon. Uh, it's it's a good size. I'd have to say it's a, a single wide, hon. Okay, very good. Thank you. So you see some of the uplifting things for her, Paul? I think it's positive, yes. I think she has choice. I think things are more in order than she suspects they are. And she's a tough lady, so she's not going to, you know, she's not going to get pushed around. When we hear you channeling... And we hear that second voice. What is yeah. that? The whisper is the transmission, and it comes. It's just how I learn to do it. I often channel directly now, but that's sometimes really loud. I mean, I don't remember what I've said, so I, <laughs> they've been doing more of that through me. The whisper is the transmission. The repetition is for the listener. East of the Rockies, Terry's with us in Columbus, Ohio. Hi, Terry. You coming to our show? I'd really love to, George. I'm going to try the best I can. All right. Love to see you. Go ahead. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm a recovering drug and alcohol addict for five years now. My folks just died a few years, within the last 10 years or so. And I've been pretty much estranged from my family, trying to cope, taking myself out of the world and isolating myself. I'm seeking God and what's going on, but I just seem stuck in my life right now. Okay. Well, congratulations on your recovery. Um, Let me tune in to you. You come in saying, as if you believe this, nobody's going to give me what I want. And then you sort of 
hunkered down and you hold yourself still and you got your fists up and this, when that's not that you want to fight it's self-protection so right now you're coming from a place of real self-protection around the rest of the world and i think that's why you're probably isolating yourself i'm going to go to you with your family just give me one of your family members names just who they are to you in their first name Oh, uh, well, that's kind of hard. It's like a, a mixed family. Um, just one name. That's all I want to tune into one to get the bunch. Um, it's okay, Terry. Let me just see what I can do without that. Well, the guys are speaking. The young man wants to know, will he be loved, will he be loved again? This, this is what this is really about. Am I, loved? Am I allowed to be loved? Am I, welcomed? Am I welcomed home? Can I come home? Can I come home? You have to go home. You have to go home. You have to rectify the history. You have to rectify the history and some of the choices you made. And some of the choices you made can be chosen, can be chosen anew, anew in a higher way with agreement, with agreement to your family, to your family. I do hear you ostracize yourself. You put yourself away. You don't have to. You don't have to. But what is, how does he approach? Is my question carefully, carefully, and with honor. Show up in your honor. Show up in your honor with your sober self, with your sober self. Show up in your willingness. Show up with your willingness to take responsibility, to take responsibility for past acts, for past acts. You will be surprised, and you will be surprised how welcome you may be. How welcomed you may be. That's what I hear. All right, good luck, Terry. Hope everything works out for you. Hopefully, the, the advice is pretty good, Paul. Well, they're good. I mean, this is what they do, you know. I mean, when I have names, I can actually sort of, if you think of me as a switchboard and I'm plugging into everybody's opinions, that's when I can usually find out what people need or what's missing, you know. Are the guides forgivable type people or individuals or entities? Are they forgivable? I mean, do they forgive? Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, it's the teachings of forgiveness are enormous. In one of the books, they said, imagine you go into a cave and the one person you never want to see again in your life is there in the cave. And then they say, that's the person you have to walk out of the cave. You have to walk them out because who you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. And that's the teaching of forgiveness. It's not to say that it was all okay and it was all right that they did the harmful thing. But it is to release ourselves from that attachment because it harms us. Would you say your gift is God-given? I think all gifts are God-given. Um, and I think this is some odd facility I have. And I don't know how in many ways it occurred. But I do think that I was developed through my life in order to be able to do this kind of work, mostly without even knowing it. Have you ever had a night where the guides don't leave you alone and you just can't get to sleep? Yeah, but not the guides. It's the energy that comes. So the energy sometimes that comes with the guides is enormously potent, and it's like a current running through my body. And when I'm doing workshops and events, that current is running through everybody. Everybody gets to feel it, which I enjoy. But often when they're preparing me for a book, they're shifting my energy to be able to hold the new teaching. And those are the nights I'm off and up. Paul, what do you think of the word manifestation? I think it's misused, and I think it's overused a bit in, in spiritual culture, because people tend to think that it's about getting something. And what I believe is that everything we see before us, we're in accord with, which doesn't mean that we made it so, but it does mean that we're in agreement to it. And so I understand manifestation as the realization of physical form. And what the guides teach is how this is source known in a lower vibrational tone and how it can be lifted and reclaimed. So it's not a teaching of just how to get the bigger car. You know, it's a teaching of how to align to everything that exists in a higher way. Let's go back to the calls. My neck of the woods in St. Louis. Mike is with us. Hi, Mike. Welcome. George, thank you for taking my call. And Paul, thank you for being so sincere on um, what you do. My two questions. Uh, first, I want to make a comment. I've been working the last year of healing myself. Uh, the first question I have, um, and I want to make a, uh, another comment real quick. I have a large family, and like the prior caller, um, I can give a couple of initials. Um, but anyway, um, two questions I have. I want to know if I will reach uh, a higher optic, 
And the second is, will I be able to help heal my family and others and uh, have reconciliation? Did you say higher optic with a P or octave with a V? Octave, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah a higher optic. I'm sorry. Me, that's fine. Let me just tune into you and see what I get. Well, you're sweet. You come through, you're saying, I'm so willing. I'm so willing. I mean, your heart's just in your hand, and you're extending it like you want everybody to know how sincere this is. Will you reconcile with your family? Is that the question? Yes, I yeah. actually hear yes. Yes. Oh gosh, Heal the family? Yes. Yes. Let me see why. The young man, the guys are speaking, the young man wants to know, is he going to get what he wants? Yes. He has to be patient for a for a period of time, because he is lifting his awareness to what's next, to what's next. What want. They're saying that what you want is actually available at the higher level. So you kind of can't take the old road there. You have to go to the higher, and then it becomes available to come to you, which is interesting. And in some ways, both of your questions are interlocked this way. Okay. When you lift to the higher you, what you want is available to you because you're not trying to fight or battle for it, okay? Much like you were saying about higher uh, manifestation, um, yeah. to uh, have it work with you and not try to get the bigger car or the bigger thing. Well, what, what I understand, if you think of God or the universe as source, and okay. then you understand that perhaps the source already knows what we actually need, what we need and what we want may be different things. It's not that you can't have what you want and learn from that. But I understand that if you go to the higher, you move to a level of receptivity where things are available without the struggle in the same way that we're used to. And we've been Thank trained so to operate much. in the struggle, and we don't have to. Good luck, Michael. Thank you. Great to be part. You, have, you, you give good advice, and more importantly, Paul, you and your spirit guides give people hope. Well, I think there's there is hope. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't um, always give people what they want. I'm afraid I, I can't do that and be comfortable with myself. But I'm hearing what is possible, and sometimes it's what is possible when we get out of our own way, and we kind of let God be God, if you want to say it that way, or you let the universe work with us and not try to force the hand so much, which is how we've all been trained to get what we want. And I think there are other ways, which is to open to receive. Gina Maria is with us in the state of Washington. Hello, Gina Maria. Hello, gentlemen. Um, love and peace and healing, and God bless to everyone and everything everywhere. Um, um, I'm, I'm at this time requesting um, my wish and hope and prayer um, that you might help me to contact my spirit guide with using my spirit guide and my daughter Ambrosia's spirit guide um, through your guides to express my love, um, my forever love, and the love of all of her family on both sides. Um, I'm hoping that she rejoins all of us and accepts my love and the love of all of her family because um, I miss and love my daughter with all of my heart. Thank you. God bless. So let me understand. You're estranged from your daughter. Is that the question? Is that what we're yes. looking at? Yes. Okay. Myself and all the family on my side and her father's side. Okay. <clears throat> let me let me go to you first, if I may. I'm Gina Maria. I hear. You. I'm already getting you. But the first thing you come through saying, which is interesting, is I don't want anybody to make me wrong. And you've got a warning finger up to to everybody, like don't make me wrong. Don't make me the bad guy. Don't do that. And there's a lot of worry and anxiety that's informing these relationships now. Give me your daughter's first name, please. Um, uh, Ambrosia. Ambrosia. Supposedly... Okay, let, me, let me go to her and see what I get. Right now, what's funny about her, it's just like she seems to know about this, if I'm getting her correctly, but she's pushing it away. It's almost, it's not like never, it's more like not now. Not now, not now. And with that comes a kind of panic. I mean, I think she actually feels the energy of your desire and may feel actually a little overwhelmed by that. So let me just ask what you might do. You have to give yourself permission to forgive her and the rest for not being who you want them to be. If you're able to do that, 
you have an enormously deep sigh of relief that comes through. And I think that also makes you available to really be in communication in an honest way. And I want to say in, a, in an open way, because right now you're coming through not wanting to be blamed and also pointing some fingers still at the others. Because I do hear this can pass. Um, so you've got to let these folks be themselves. Be available. Let them come to you. Don't force the hand. I feel with the daughter, I actually feel you that there is a reuniting that can, can and I think, I get Will. They're actually saying, yes, Will, they're giving me thumbs up. So I hope that helps, and I wish you the best. Thanks, Gina. Will you do an email question, Paul? Yeah, I can. I can do her, my her name is Linda from Ontario, Canada. She cannot call in. And uh, she's been a dedicated listener for years. And she wants to know if you see anything on her current health issues that she needs to address. She's 76 years old. Well, as as I say, I'm not a medical intuitive. I'll tune in and see what I hear. She's got to be careful with her body and careful. I mean, it's it's not so much about frailty, but it's almost, when I go to her, it's, uh, it's almost holding on to the railing when you go down that narrow flight of stairs. It's really being very, very conscious of the body because the body doesn't always seem to be doing what it's expected to do or what you would have it do. So I'm not predicting something bad. I'm just saying she's got to be very conscientious. Let me see if I can hear anything for her. I, I don't know that there's a real restoration to health coming, but I do think that this is part of a process, and some of what she's going to need to do is to acclimate to what is now going on as what she can manage and handle. She's actually able to do this. But again, I can, I'm literally holding on to a bar. That could be a bar in a shower. It can be a bar. It feels like a narrow stair where you have like to a basement or if it's a narrow stairway in a house, but I want her to be holding on, okay? I'm, my, my only concern, honestly, is feeling like something could give out unintentionally, you know? So I just want her to stay safe with herself and be mindful. All right, there you go, Linda. Hope you're listening. And let's go to Robert in Tampa, Florida on the wild card line. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. First time caller. Um, I love the show. I love the program. Thank you. I guess, I guess my question is, um, how can I become a better version of myself, whether it be uh, personally mm-hmm. or in business? Let me tune in to you. The guys are saying the young man wants to know, will he get what he wants? He's actually preparing for it. It's not about becoming a better person or provision or an improved version. It's about becoming who you really are and can only be in truth. The aspect of you that loves and wants a good life must be fostered, must be fostered, must be claimed, must be claimed as your right, as your right. It's my right, it is my right to have a good life and to be a good man, being a good man. Being a good man isn't something, that up, isn't something you get out of instead of something else. It's who you, are. It's who you really are. Your innate goodness, your innate goodness is what you need to rely upon as it flowers, as it flowers, your life reflects it, your life reflects it, period. And they're saying, period. Any follow-up question, Robert? Yes. Uh, so why... Why am I perceived so differently sometimes? And if there's one letter that I'm visualizing, what letter would that be that comes through? I'm not going to do that kind of mind reading if that's what you're asking me to do. Okay. Is that the question? What letter are you thinking of? Yeah. No, I don't do that. All right, next up, Barbara in Tennessee. Go ahead, Barb. Go ahead. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for taking my call. Thank you. Um, I have been thinking about buying some land and possibly building a house in the future. And I'm struggling with where I want to build because I'm thinking family, taking them with me. Mm -hmm. What are are the options you're considering, please? Um, I've been seriously think about staying inside Tennessee, but I've also been 
debating on whether Florida, West Virginia, or Virginia. I, I would, I would, if, when I go to you, I get a thumbs up on Tennessee, and you're actually, I think, kind of where you want to be. I mean, you're pointing down. And when you're pointing down, it's kind of like where you are now, presently, and in the vicinity of it. I actually feel that if you were to leave, you'd be a bit frustrated. And I think you'd be frustrated that things weren't what they were. And I yeah. think in this case, you're kind of comfortable knowing where your feet are placed. You want to know where you I, go. And that's actually I am useful. comfortable. Yeah, well, that's I, what I feel, too. But so I, I also want to move out of Memphis. <laughs> um, I would say and you're looking at the vicinity, and I would look at like two places over. I don't know the area, so I can't tell you what's there. This doesn't feel city to me, but it does feel suburban. I mean, it's, you know, residential street with houses. So it's not a downtown situation that I'm seeing for you at all. But you do need to go where you're happy. And I think if you're looking at another house, I think you're looking at something that may not be brand new but would have only had two owners and feels good. It feels good. It feels like there's been family there and love there. And I think you would respond to that, and that would feel right to you, and that's what's going to be useful. Good luck, Barbara. I hope everything works out for you. Paul, do you take calls personally for people? Yeah. I do. How does how does that work? How do they get a hold of you? Through your website? Through my website, yeah, through my website. It's, I don't do as many readings as I used to because I'm I'm back to traveling and doing doing more live events, but I like to keep the practice and yeah, you know, and it works the same as I work here except I'm on, you know, Zoom and I can see people and they can see me. Sessions a little longer? Depth. Yep, 15 minutes, half an hour, either one. That's pretty intense. It's intense, but a lot gets done very quickly. Well, you can tell that you enjoy doing what you're doing. People can get the Book of Innocence at Amazon? Yep. It's up on Amazon. It's pre-order. It's out on Tuesday this week, the uh, the 19th. We're ahead of the game, aren't we? We're a couple of days ahead, yep. I noticed that you had Deepak Chopra in the book as well. He, um, he has gave a wonderful endorsement for my work. He came for a reading once, and I guess it was helpful for him, and he's been supportive of my work. In 20 seconds or less, what advice would you give to people who just seem lost? Don't be so frightened of yourself. It's something that you move through. You need to have to, you have to trust that you have the right to go there beyond what you've had. And nobody's necessarily going to do it for you, so you have to say, yes, I'm allowed to move beyond my fear and my fear of the unknown. Super. Thank you, Paul, for being on the program. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.